Good uh, evening, everybody. Welcome to um, the third in our series of exploring uh, events. Uh, this is the Sheffield Hallam University Space and Place Group, and you're uh, all uh, very welcome for uh, this evening. Um, we are going to move uh, swiftly into uh, the start of our proceedings. Um, here are some uh, basic uh, arrangement details. Uh, we'll have four main presentations. I'm going to say a few words of opening, uh, but not delay uh, the, the, the main start uh, by too, too, too much preamble. Uh, the event will finish uh, by 9.30 uh, this evening. Uh, we've extended the meeting to 9.30 in order to ensure that we have some time for questions, but we will stop by 9.30. Uh, please do comment and raise questions um, via the chat function as we go along. Uh, this event is being recorded um, and will be uploaded in sort of raw raw format, as in unedited format, uh, to our group's YouTube site, um, probably at some point over the weekend. Uh, if anybody says something that they really wish they hadn't said and it gets recorded, into this uh, raw recording, please do let me know by seven o'clock tomorrow. Um, but it is a real bind to do the editing. So please just try not to say anything um, that you wish you hadn't said, um, if at all possible. Um, and uh, so I'm just uh, admitting a few more people, which is why I got distracted there. Uh, the group does upload its uh, recordings to uh, YouTube. We've been sort of online since COVID and we find it quite a good way to exist. We've had um, 52 people book for today's event from uh, all across the UK and and, and further afield. Um, and it certainly enables us to have that full reach uh, and to um, uh, have really uh, interesting contributions uh, in terms of our speakers and so forth. This is the third event um, tonight on the rocks. Uh, we've previously gone underground and wandered around in ruins, uh, online at least. Um, and uh, so this uh, presentation continues in that vein. Um, we have one further event uh, beyond this one um, entitled On Your Bike, which is about mountain biking. Uh, and you can enjoy that in December, uh, should you wish to, signing up in the same way that you signed up for today. Our first event back in July uh, featured three uh, presentations, thinking about the motivations of those who might wander around ruins. Um, and really, that is what we're concerned with um, in this series, is thinking about how motivations to explore seemingly blank, empty, unimportant places come to some, but not necessarily to all, uh, and what the, the logics and the, um, uh, the meaning making of those uh, persons may happen to be. Um, in our last session, we were concerned with examining the uh, means, motives, practices, etc., of those who wish to go um, underground. Um, and this evening, I'm delighted to say that we're perhaps embracing more of the creative practitioner side of the um, of the equation. If the equation is a question, and the question is um, why do people want to hang out in these places, um, we have a, a, a lovely cross section, uh, both of practitioners and of analysts, um, considering. Uh, the motives of those who might, as I put it in some of the promotional material for this, uh, wish to lurk in quarries. Now that phrasing seemed to um, attract quite a bit of uh, attention to this event, which I'm of course very pleased with. Uh, the idea of lurking has a slight sort of ominous um, tone to it, uh, which is cheeky and intentional, which is the tone very much of these, um, uh, these sessions. Um, and certainly thinking about a quarry, you think of emptiness, you think of desolation intermixed with material sort of debris, or at least that's what I think of. And then I think of semi-vertical or fully vertical edges, uh, surfaces upon which um, people might gaze or uh, clamber. In order to warm things up and get us started, I just wanted to think back to um, uh, uh, some work that I was doing at De Norwig Quarry um, 10 years ago, and you'll hear others uh, mentioning De Norwig um, amongst other locations and the proceedings this evening. Massive former slate uh, quarry in North Wales. Um, and I was taken 10 years ago by this image of, um, as, they, as they might say, someone up from London uh, who decided to appropriate the blank surfaces of this former slate quarry uh, for a bit of uh, a bit of uh, high class graffiti action and caused a right old stink uh, in doing so. 
uh, and uh, upset all of the people to whom this empty space was their empty space, uh, not least of which um, local uh, climbing fraternity. The action of um, hewing uh, slate from its sort of seams and, and rock beds um, uh, is, is a job, is a work of labour, but as this quote wonderfully sort of captures, it also has its own, I suppose, art and artistry um, to it. And so the idea of bringing art into a quarry, if we mix it in with craft of doing, I think we get a nice sort of continuity um, at play there. But of course, these places also have their heritage resonances. And we'll also pick up on some of that, I think, in some of the presentations today. What is the role of heritage? What is the role of legacy? Um, both positive and negative uh, within these places as they try and move forward and have new uses cast upon their uh, now empty surfaces. Um, there's also those who try and research things, count things, uh, build knowledge by going into these spaces. And I came across this uh, book, Delving in Dinorwig, um, which is actually written by an industrial train enthusiast. So you'll even, even get train spotters uh, in quarries uh, doing their thing of amassing information and becoming expert in something that uh, not many other people are that inclined to become expert about. But that is part of the meaning making sort of schemas that we will encounter if we linger or lurk in quarries and rock places and the types of people who we will have to intermingle with and find accommodation with as we try and share these surfaces, each of which we're summoned to for our own particular purposes. So enough from me to try and prime us uh, and predict perhaps where we'll range across in the presentations. Um, I've explained to the uh, presenters I have a very light touch in terms of the way in which I introduce people. I, I just do a sort of factual introduction of so-and-so is about to speak and then I invite them to say about themselves if they wish or to limp or to launch, um, uh, strictly speaking, directly into their uh, presentation. So in that spirit, I'm going to call upon uh, Victoria, please, uh, to uh, start her presentation up. I'm going to stop my screen sharing and invite you, Victoria, to uh, uh, come up to the podium. We can see your presenter view. Great. Thank, Thank you, Luke. Thank you. Can you, can you see everything okay? It's all looking great. Um, brilliant. Thank you. Um, so, hi, I'm Vic. Um, I'm an artist based in Sheffield. I'm currently in my studio at Block. Um, I'm also uh, a 0.5 senior lecturer in fine art at the University of Central Lancashire. Um, and I'm doing a part time PhD at, at Sheffield Palham as well. My working title at the moment, um, and it changes quite regularly, is Reclamation Ground, a material reckoning with women's subjectivity through art incorporating technology. Um, my practice is essentially an, an interrogation of landscape, specifically landscapes that have been disturbed and transformed by human intervention um, in pursuit of capitalist growth. and. Um, I often start with a site, um, often a post-industrial site, and I use technology and sculptural processes to extract data and forms um, before taking those back to the studio to develop um, a body of work. Um, and as an artist, I, I think my aim is to dislocate myself from the humanist position within the landscape specifically in the context of an environmental crisis and, and also through my own embodied experiences in place. Um, and I work with video, photography, storytelling, performance and sculpture. Um, just a little bit about my interest in quarries. So I, I started working in quarries uh, in 2018 when I did a residency in Worksworth, um, which is in Derbyshire. And um, I spent a couple of months with Harlem Art Space, which is a, a kind of, yeah, really amazing program of um, residencies and exhibitions um, in the in the heart of Worksworth. Um, and this was the last project I worked on before I went off on maternity for a, a year. Um, so I was, was quite heavily pregnant when I um, undertook this residency, as you can almost see in that picture. Um, and you'll understand why that is relevant. 
uh, as I as I talk um, further. Yeah, so um, as part of this residency, I uh, combined these site visits with archive visits, and I became really interested in the accounts of witch trials and the burning of heretics um, in the local area. There were lots of kind of stories of um, specifically women who were put on trial um, and, uh, uh, yeah, con uh, condemned and um, hanged for supposed witchcraft. And their voices were absent. So I found this kind of repetition in the archive where they were accounts written by uh, men in power, essentially. And they, they, they described uh, these women's lives, their, um, you know, their kind of wrongdoings, um, but they, they never get, got to spoke themselves. So the work that I developed, um, I can move my slides on, the work that I developed um in response to this site was uh, was this piece called where rock and hard place meet and it's a composite so the um the print on the fabric which is positioned in a, a kind of curved quarry shape um is a yeah is a, a sort of collage of lots of different quarries that i visited over um the residency and then on the screen there's this uh i guess an agent this kind of character who um reimagines those women's voices as if they were kind of seeping out of the quarry face so it becomes a kind of fictional narrative where i reunite those women's voices with the landscape um as a way of sort of questioning um how histories are uh archived are, are, are kind of um uh, gathered uh, and and sort of passed down through generations um, as part of that project, I met um, a, a, another curator who was working in the same building at the time, uh, she's called Dana, and she had a quarry on her land and she, we got chatting about quarries and um, she invited me to go to her quarry, um, which was absolutely incredible and uh, completely changed this project and, and kind of led me to study and work with quarries for like two years um, after I got back from my maternity leave. Um, this is the first, uh, an image of the first visit to the quarry and um, it was taken in August 2018. And the, the quarry is quite amazing. It's quite small, it's quite intimate. Um, it's a site of special scientific interest. It used to be a penny quarry um so you know people from the local area used to come and um, pay a penny for a certain weight of rock um and um i found out later after the kind of meeting with a quarry archaeologist that the rock would uh it wasn't that good in terms of its quality and its strength so it would have perhaps been used for nearby roads uh dry stone walls farm buildings um, and interestingly, the quarry first appears on a map in 1897, and even then it's given the name Old Quarry. So I found it really hard to kind of pin down when this was an active site, but obviously it's been used for a very long time. I mean, it's just a stunning place. It's really otherworldly. Um, and I was really uh, taken by it so much. So throughout my maternity, I couldn't stop thinking about this site and really wanted to return and it became a kind of metaphor for thinking through aspects of capitalist extraction on a, on a really small scale, uh, specifically as, as a kind of historical site that had been defeated for some time. Um, and and I, the scale was really important, particularly in relationship to the body, um, in terms of um, the, the kind of way that it moved and enveloped the body when you walked into it. There was a really narrow path that led to this kind of opening. Um, and it, you, you kind of were surrounded by by these these kind of rock faces, um, which is really quite striking. Um, and, you know, there's, there's this kind of obvious uh, renewal, process of renewal going on, um, you know, uh, in, in the wake of this kind of destructive process of quarrying um, and um, and so you know I was thinking about reclamation I was thinking about this initial project that I 
started thinking about women in the landscape and and how women might reclaim these kind of sites of destruction, these these kind of sites of exploitation. Um, and um, and I you know I was kind of really also in this kind of reflective period thinking about my body as I sort of transitioned into becoming a birthing body and a mother and and so there there was there were all sorts of things kind of um percolating through at that time um and my embodied experience was almost then projected onto the landscape and and vice versa as well throughout this process of working with this site um and yeah I, I'm also really interested in it, this quarry is a space in which nature and culture collide, in which they overlap, they intersect, and there's like a tension that interests me as well between the landscape, but also my body as as kind of contested sites that sit between nature and culture um, in in a lot of different contexts. So that you know there were there were lots of things going on at the time with this this kind of uh, thought process. And the first experimentation that I undertook when I got back from maternity and, and revisited the site uh, was this performative series of photographs in which I'm sort of enacting becoming the landscape until I feel like my body's been reclaimed by it through this, this kind of photographic process. So the, the blanket um, that I'm using here to sort of shroud my body um, presents nature as a surface that can be worn and it allows me to visibly transform through a series of photograph shrouded contortions. So it's really quite fun to do, trying to kind of disguise my body and transform my body into rock, essentially. Um, so the soft blanket is draped in a way that reconfigures the materiality of its pictured subject, i.e. me, and, and the hardened rock becomes a, a kind of, becomes wrapped and folded and grasped suspended and moulded through this method of posturing um, and these are the the kind of resulting that's the resulting series uh, where I'm seeking to become a rock essentially um, so yeah it, that was a really kind of playful start to the project um, at a similar time I was looking at um, of thinking about strata and cutting and layers and um, this project, the strata of things uh, sort of developed out of that really. So there's a series of three sculptures that work with the materiality of vinyl. So this is this kind of very plasticky man-made material that I'm using um, because what I'm doing is I'm referencing the aesthetic and the kind of utopian vision of advertising hoardings, which were kind of positioned around this area. So this is a, a gallery site in somebody's front yard in Burley and Leeds. So it's it's you know it's a kind of cityscape, very, very urban landscape. Um, and again, so you have this kind of collision between um uh nature, uh industry, um and then this kind of urban environment that's that's been born out of those processes as well. And um, kind of uh, prompts you to look at your surroundings, this kind of urban environment in a different way, whether it, whether it be the bricks or the way that the tiles have been constructed, or like, you know, the kind of fence from where the woods come from. So it's a kind of a, a, a material awakening almost um, uh, just, just through that kind of process. Um, so I'm presenting the geological strata of the earth through the strata of the cut image of the quarry face. And also that labored repetition of physically cutting into the imagery became this sort of recreation of the act of carving into rock. And it also made me think of building up sediment through the slow time of stone as well. So there's all these kind of different associations that I was thinking of when cutting through this fabric, this um, material. Um, and also obviously there's the kind of laborious nature of quarrying and um, it was interesting earlier, Luke, when you were talking about the art history of quarrying and that kind of crossover. Um, that's something that I've really thought about, you know, thinking about digging down into the earth to exploit what lies beneath the surface and and that kind of 
methodological destruction of, of material, whether it be the, the landscape or the image. So there were lots of things kind of, um, uh, sort of taking place in, in this work. Um, and what was really nice as well, uh, when it was installed, it was kind of activated by the weather. So the this, this sort of constructed surface of nature was kind of whipped up and um, swayed and uh, as animated by the breeze. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it just it just kind of revealed other forms. And I, I kind of didn't anticipate that, um, which I, yeah, I really, really enjoyed. Um, whilst all this was kind of taking place, this was sort of initial um, testing, I was revisiting this site. I, I revisited this site quite a lot over over the two years um, and it, it experimented with other, with other things as well, so other ways of making. So I became really interested in the fissures and the cracks in the rock as sort of these liminal spaces. So thinking about boundaries and thresholds between air and rock and it becoming a kind of place of passage, um, thinking about shelter, small caves, a path uh, that lead into the earth. Um, and that related back to this idea of sounds and voices and, you know, the kind of narratives that were seeping out of the rock in, in that, that kind of earlier piece from Wordsworth. Um, and I became really focused on recreating rock, essentially, and, and casting these cracks in the earth. Um, and and so this is the kind of process. So I I took I got some alginate and took it on site and was um, and, and very carefully sort of cast this small crack in the in the rock face in the quarry. Um, and then took that back to the studio, um, cast it in plaster, and then embedded that into polystyrene. Um, so I, I also I'm really interested in materials and and kind of natural and and man made. And um and how that translates uh, that's something that I've, I'm kind of exploring as well, and then um yeah over time it was carved I I covered it in um paper mache uh, which was also a really interesting process so it was kind of using this pulp and and attaching it to the surface and using the the end of my fingers to kind of create this um weathered surface um to replicate the rock um. So yeah, all, all of these kind of material transformations are taking place just through that making process. And then this is the final version, which was installed as part of a, an installation in the end. So I'll talk about that work. Um, this was all happening for 2020, 2021. Um, so when there were travel restrictions imposed due to the pandemic, and I couldn't visit the quarry, I began visiting the site virtually. Um, and I found that really interesting because it meant that I could virtually sink through the map um, and look at the uh, site from um, a different perspective, one that you couldn't access in real life. Um, and um, it again really kind of fascinated me and at that time I was also thinking about ways of flattening the surface of the rock face and um, replicating that surface through photography um, and so I, I came to this process of photogrammetry um, and uh, yeah I worked with a company we went to the quarry we took thousands of photographs of every single angle of the space um, uh, and put that through some software which then resulted in this amazing 3D model um, and that process in itself was like quarrying um, so we went we mined this data we took this data we fed that through software that created this kind of aggregated version of a quarry um, so digital aggregate and 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 so this it becomes a kind of constitution of this matter and what I really love about it is how sculptural it is um you know there's a real kind of crossover between the digital and the sculptural in the way that it, it kind of exists in that virtual space um and 
I then use that to um, flatten out that quarry face um, and created this 60 meter long representation of this aggregated representation of quarry um, of, of rock um, and, and uh, you know, kept that kind of digital aesthetic through the, um, the wire mesh that is overlaid. And that, that's how that kind of form is constructed through that software. Um, and yeah, I found it really, really fascinating that I could use technology in that way to deconstruct and reconstruct and, and reference that language of quarrying through the making process. Um, when I'd done that, I, I, I was still really sort of ca uh, captivated by um yeah by this this sort of model and um when I was playing around with it I realized I could flip it upside down and that this kind of skin like landscape um allowed me to kind of stand underneath the surface or be underneath the surface of the quarry looking up at the boundary layer so suddenly I was in the rock kind of looking up and the boundaries of my body and the kind of surfaces within that quarry suddenly shifted and um, became enmeshed and um, perspectives completely changed. So um, I thought to create an experience in which the viewer was guided through this, this constructed um, space, this constructed landscape, so that you could sort of move through the surface of the quarry and become the rock or become the moss um, become the air and and really uh, uh, um, become entangled in the materiality of that space through the work um, and the narrative as well. Um, the moss is a real feature of the work that I make, and this is an incredible uh, sort of colony of moss that's completely reclaimed that space. So that crack. That, that sort of cut of the rock has been um, taken over by this uh, vibrant, thriving colony of uh, Polychicum commune moss. Um, and it changes through the seasons as well. So um, in summer you could lie down on it and it's it's really thick. It's about 40 centimeters high. It's like a big string, springy mattress. And then um, in spring you can sort of wade through it in wellies and it's, um, you know, it's waterlogged. Um, it's it's really incredible. So the uh, narrative that I started to develop um, in response to this site as part of the video work that I, I made um, centered on this moss. And I was reading a lot of Robin Wall Kimmerer at the, at, at the time, and she writes about matriarchal moss colonies and this, this kind of biological um, um, relationship between male and female gametophytes and um, the the kind of expulsion of hormones and you know it became a very kind of um, uh, sexualized space after reading that and so I was thinking a lot about kind of um, yeah matriarchal moss colonies and this this kind of absorption of um, of the, uh, the kind of destructive forces of capitalism um, and this kind of transformation back to nature, and that became a kind of central central theme. For us. Um, it's a, yeah, useful. So these are some of the stills from my for the film that I made in response. Um, so there's this kind of spoken narrative, and it describes how my body as the artist is also deconstructed and reclaimed by the matriarchal moss colony. So I'm thinking about my own um exploitation from like a feminist perspective and my own um uh cultural upbringing and those kind of boundaries that are set within society and and kind of opening those up and really thinking about um the sort of uh, the gendered the gendered space and the gendered body and and how we might begin to um reclaim that through place and place making so um yeah i'm essentially in this narrative reclaimed by the matriarchal moss colony that nice now thrives out of the quarried landscape and then i become part of the the rocky kind of strata beneath um 
and I, I really think that that transformation of the of bodily material that kind of um deconstruction of flesh and um you know kind of the the boundaries of skin that really um came to the fore after experiencing um uh sort of birth and um growing a person inside of my body and that kind of transformation from being one person to two people and it, it, there again there was a real kind of crossover with my embodied experience at that time and the narrative that I built up around this site. Um, there's another still as well. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is the, the, the piece installed in the gallery. Um, it's a single channel video and the camera shifts virtually in and out of the skin of the quarry. So as I said, the perspective of the, the viewer becomes uh, uh, rock, becomes air, earth, moss, water, back to human. There's a kind of process of being absent and present in the space. And then there's this kind of narrative that that um, is, is kind of otherworldly and um, dematerializes um, the body and, and, and entangles the material of that site um, until there's the, and, until there's nothing left in the end it's yeah um, alongside that there was another piece that I made um, called Coalesce and it this was a video projection and it was exhibited in the same space and it incorporates a, a sort of disembodied female voice um, alongside found documentation of quarry explosions um, and, and also some of the footage that I gathered at site at the site. And the found footage um, is sort of collage. So there's all of these explosions that are, are almost breathing. So they, they explode and then they come together again. And there's a kind of um, a, a kind of pulsation that takes place through these this kind of um, uh, footage of explosions and quarries and it reveals this violence of industrial the industrial process um, and and thinks about this kind of nature as resource I suppose um, and uh, yeah and, and uh, then this this kind of um, this uh, pulsating visualization shift and then you move into the quarry and this kind of reclamation of the quarry through the, the kind of um, the mossy layer that's grown along the surface of the, the rock. Um, and so that, you know, this kind of speaks of like the timeless violence of capitalism against the other body um, and these kind of geological material forms become this um, metaphorical illustration of the, uh, the destructive forces of late capitalism. And specifically in the context of, of the environmental crisis. Um, yeah, so um, I, do, I don't know how much time I've got left, Luke. How much time are you bidding for? I've got two minutes. Uh, two minutes, is, two minutes is fine, Victoria. Yeah, go, go for it. Okay, okay. Um, I will... I'm hoping that the sound works. Let me know if it doesn't, and then we'll have a little look. We're not getting any audio. Okay. okay. Uh, any ideas on how we change that? Oh, hang on. I think I might have done it. Okay. Think of my body and how everything is made up of the same thing. I am the rock. I am the moss. I am the landscape. The water in my body is drawn downwards towards the gametophytes. I imagine myself as the absent stone, compressed under the weight of time bodily liquid oozing out of its encasement to quench the thirst of my bryophyte ancestors. Moss, the first land-based plant, a unique environment that supports all other species to grow. 
She supports me now as I bear down in what feels like the centre of the Earth's embrace. The moss is magnificently hormonal. Radiating the essence of their matriarchal powers, their daughters thrive out of the violence that ravaged the Earth. Their skill and resilience is powerfully silent. Their quiet knowing fills the quarry. I unwittingly lay upon a bed of radical feminists, and I can feel their power on my skin, in my lungs, in my blood. Here, I melt into her presence silently, and all that I am is reclaimed by her. Heightened senses, the allure of moss washes over me, filling my body with euphoric electricity. I breathe deeply, calmly. Something inside is ignited, my own source of feminine power that has been laying dormant all of these years. Called up from the depths of my bones, from the pit of my stomach, from the inside of my veins. Okay, that's a few minutes. That, that's great, thank you very much. Um, just uh, whilst anyone who'd like to put a question in on the chat um takes a few moments to put a question in on the chat um can i can i start off um i've got loads of sort of semi questions buzzing around in my mind so i'm going to put it together as a single question but to what extent is your project in the quarry about regendering the quarry or are you asserting a fundamental feminine identity to a quarry you're finding it sort of beneath the the surface of the male extraction you're you're finding something feminine beneath or are you trying to recode the the quarry or is it neutral did, did you see what my question is trying to get to yeah i, I think it's a, a de-gendering so it's a it's a um it's a it's a kind of shift away from this humanist notion of what gender is to get to the the matter and the you know the fact that 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 um materially everything is connected and you know ancestrally everything is connected uh the moss was like the first plant that um uh, that that grew on land uh, millions of years ago and and then everything else kind of grew out of that there's this kind of pain and this is kind of connectivity biologically speaking between my body and the the, the rock which is um you know a, a, a kind of a, a mass of um <laughs> dead plant matter uh that uh you know kind of um material from millions of years ago that's been compressed over time there's a there's a real um shift towards thinking materially rather than through that kind of gendered lens, I think, in the work. Um, but also alongside that, there's this kind of embodied experience of, of the birthing body and thinking about how that is framed within culture as well and trying to unpick that a little bit. So thinking about that kind of shift in identity at that time from, from being a, a, a woman to a mother and, and what that kind of process feels like um uh but again kind of try, trying to open it out a little bit and and um yeah de-gender it and just just kind of experience it for what it is rather than yeah through this kind of cultural cultural prison okay thank you uh still no questions in the chat so i'm going to come up with another one um very early on, you showed us your first sort of gallery installation, which was the curved sort of quarry mm. quarry wall. And and when I first saw that image, I didn't really think much of it. it. I don't mean in a quality sense, but it didn't sort of strike me. But then later on, about five minutes in, it felt like five minutes in, there was a picture at the quarry that you said you knew the owner of. And that was also sort of curved. And it suddenly got me sort of thinking about the the intimacy the embrace of of these sort of confined spaces and then I started looking at the the um the rock surfaces and 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 suddenly I lost all notion of emptiness and I suddenly saw loads of faces staring at me not actual mm -hmm. 
sort of human faces, but just all of these sort of angles as though they were lots of identities. And you, you, you'd hinted in your first opening comments about that first gallery expo exhibition about how you'd linked it to sort of witch trials and you were trying to give a voice to, to the witches. Did, did you perhaps want to say a little bit more about whether the, the rock faces act in that piece as a, a as a device for summoning a host? If you see where I'm coming from. Yeah. I, th I think there are, yeah, in a lot of my sort of previous work, I, I had this, this kind of agent or avatar that voiced the voice, voiced on behalf of the voiceless, um, like, like this kind of TV based face that, that, that kind of becomes this way of communicating these, these women's experiences in that initial uh, piece. And I think um, in this project, I unexpectedly became became part of the work. So I wasn't intending for my own subjectivity to become part of the work. But through my kind of repeated engagement with this site and through this um, relationship that I built up with the site through kind of uh, lurking or lingering in that space um, for long periods and, and and sort of getting to know it I I feel like I sort of became part of that space and it in the end kind of reclaimed me and my understanding of my own subjectivity I think um, as a as a kind of nature body as a as a kind of material being um, and so I think that there is that, that intimacy is really important. I think that's a really key word because I felt it was a very intimate experience in that space where I essentially reconnected with my natural, the natural, um, you know, we are all sort of nature beings. Um, and the, yeah, the moss, the moss and, um, and that kind of layer of, living matter on the rock I think became became the avatar almost that became the agent in which I could communicate those intimacies I don't know if that answers your question so I think it's more the moss rather than the rock okay okay um, um, there's a question in the chat I don't know if you can see the see the chat um, no okay so uh, I'll just read it out it's from Carolyn um it's Oh, there's two now. It's hard to avoid the metaphorical relationship between the form of the quarry and the womb, which wouldn't be there without the extraction and devastation of landscape by men. Uh, Chimera also talks about exchanges with nature. You refer to being part of the work. Was the relationship reciprocal? I guess you might say that's the answer I've just given. I don't know whether you want to add any more. Just reading it. Um, yeah, the 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 shape of the quarry is is very womb like. I did I did kind of notice that. Um, particularly when you zoom out at the end, there's a there's kind of an end scene where you can kind of, I zoom out of the three D model. Um, so... Yeah, I think I think so. It felt like that, but it's hard to know. <laughs> Okay. Um, I I felt a uh, an uh, I felt a an exchange that I couldn't I I wouldn't be able to describe. I think. Um, okay. Yeah. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna sort of summarize and give you a final question based upon Susie's um question, which I I think is coming at it from the point of view of a lot of your um explanation has been about your individual very intimate relationship. An experience of of the quarries that you were immersed in um is there a sense or have you an opinion on on how communities can reclaim these sites of sort of explosive violence is there a sort of communal and a local and a reown reowning kind of dimension that can be put to play um, well, with this particular site, it was on private land, so it's not something I really had to consider. And I was, I was, I felt very fortunate that I was 
there alone um and and that's what created that intimate experience because I knew that you know there were there were no kind of rights of way through that space it was it was yeah. it was essentially somebody's garden um and so I I had this really uh, you know amazing amazing kind of opportunity to to fully experience being in this uh in this quarry site alone as a woman feeling safe um without feeling like I was going to be interrupted or um yeah moved off the land or you know I felt like I could linger and it 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 was it was okay um so um I think I I had that permission yeah um and so it felt very different to maybe a, a something that would be in a public yeah. public landscape well that's great thanks for starting us off so um so strongly i'm going to move us along now um our uh next presentation is a recorded presentation uh by mark goodwin we've got mark here who's going to speak in the q a um mark is both a climber and also uh, a poet and sound artist so um what i would ask is when i start to play this if you can't hear the sound please shout at me via the chat because I would hate for you not to get the sound I've got no reason to believe you won't get the sound but don't suffer in silence if you can't hear the sound because it's important that you can hear the sound so um, I'm going to play uh, Mark's uh, recorded um, video which is a, a, a an audio visual collage um, uh, with input from um, uh, Nikki Clayton to so give Nikki a credit as well uh, for this piece of work so uh, I'll uh, I'll get that uh, up and uh, up and running. The tale of the journey is a long poem that remembers a collaborative exploration made by a poet, photographer and climber. The following sound-enhanced version of that poem is a mix of on-location field recordings, including my performing the poem amongst the slate slabs and rubble of Dinoric quarries in North Wales in January 2018. I note that my voice sounds now somewhat older than it did then. Back in January 2009, I shared a trip with photographer Nicky Clayton and internationally renowned rock climber Johnny Dawes. Together, we went down into Dinoic quarries. These vast holes of haunting slate consist of 40 galleries, hundreds of feet deep, extending over an area of 700 acres. They are a climber's playground, and the many tunnels, inclines, winding houses, and vertiginous rusting ladders offer exhilarating and bewitching opportunity for exploration. However, the slate ancient sadness and pain this place contains is sharp. For these mountainside holes were where many Welsh people struggled and suffered to extract slate. This place killed people. Since my teens in the 1980s, I have had a go at making poems from this ruptured ground and have also given time to audio recording its rich sound sculptural atmosphere, dripping water, cronking ravens and sliding slate scree. The tale of the journey is one of my more successful struggles with this intricately layered place of deep rift and play. The Sound Enhanced Poem is now, for the first time, accompanied by a stills montage made from some of the photos Nikki took on the day, back in 2009. Before we play the ensemble, 
Here are some informative notes referring to Johnny and rock climbing practice and to locations named in the poem. At the end of the poem, I use the word line. Line is another word for root or rock climb. Rock climbing guidebooks will often refer to a good natural line when a climb follows an aesthetic logic laid down by geology, or at least we can imagine it that way. Johnny Dawes is often described as a legend of British climbing. During the 1980s, he produced the first rock climbs to be graded E8 and E9, the E standing for extreme. Dawes is an artist of sorts, a unique visionary and practitioner of movement and adhesion. He is also a profoundly gifted poetic climate writer. Heaven's Walls refers to a climbing area in Lost World. Lost World is one of the huge quarries of Dunoig. The Quarryman is the name of a revolutionary rock climb first put up by Johnny Dawes back in the 80s. Watford Gap is the name of a large notch through which the Donoric Quarry's main right-of-way footpath passes. This notch is very close to the Quarryman. I mention what I call the hydro om. This refers to a special sound. There is an entire hydroelectric power station secreted beneath the quarries, inside the mountain. The hum of this power station pervades the quarries and at different intensities, depending on the acoustic quality of the tunnels and galleries you find yourself in. In the bottom of Lost World there was, and perhaps still is, a strange seam of sound that one can walk through. This is perhaps a standing wave of sound, or some other acoustic phenomenon, and possibly caused by the two parallel levels, the wet level and the dry, that tunnel into Lost World. The little slate-built shed, I mention, located in the bottom of Lost World, has since vanished under a massive rockfall. It is truly sad that this once very beautiful frondy realm in the bottom of the quarries has now been totally erased by a craze of slate rubble. Such is loss, and thus is the relentlessness of entropy.
the tale of the journey to the dead engine in the shed at the bottom of heaven's walls. For Johnny. On the slate shelf, the slate-backed book. See the slaty pages open. Once upon a distance, near, near ago, three characters began and began a trip to the depths of slates, quarry near Dunoic. The three's names scratched on a leaf of slate, Oni, Icky, Ark. All followers each along their way of a fancy slaty dragon's trailing, rattling tail. Oni led snakily along levels and down ladders. Ark said slate and felt slate sounds, smooth and sharp, through his mouth. And Ark engraved on Slate's wafer flakes, Slate's words with Slate's brittle tongue. Icky clicked her eye and took Slate's shapely colours as keepsakes on membranes, greys rainbows, and slates sights, framed for eyes. Oni danced with and on slates shapes. On his body fitted to slates lips, simply like tiles and rain. Oni was slates nimble limbs. On his stretched, soft flesh across, slate's solidity and stretched slate's fluid through fixed flesh. Now follow the slivers, the little slaty prints the thin tick-ticks of slate time and sly sing. Don't be late, don't be late for old slate. And slate's chapters and keep sakes. Bus stop quarry car park. The graceful furniture of fence jumping goats walking between the barbed wire. The quarryman eating salad at Watford Gap, riding slate's incline. The groundless train track, train track, train rack. The slate scree stack and slate artichokes. Slate's stalker and telegraph pole crucifix. Along the level beyond lost world. The moss coated slate gang plank and sheepy crossbones. Chat with a rowan on the edge of Slate's abyss. The dizzy view of the shed and the pool. Down the rust red thready ladders. The wet level and the dry. Into the garden. Oni draws his lines on a slice of slate. 
the shed and the dead engine. The seamless sound. Hydro on. Of course, they all lived. So, watch the sl eight book clip. Sh at. I'm going to uh, open again the slate book. I'm going to return to one of its chapters, the one called Oni Draws His Line on a Slice of Slate. The mercurial Oni is grounding himself at this point. What he is doing here is looking at the slate cliff and visualizing how to climb it. In fact, he is beginning to work out how he might put up a fresh new route so as to ascend heaven's walls. As Oni visualizes and dances the moves in air, finger tipping his forecasted crimps, his body and limbs hieroglyphing his relaxed tenses of futures. He again, and now, pauses to pick up a tile of slate and then, delicately, and with his tongue just protruding from his mouth, corner as if to keep some arcane word stuck there on the moment of release. Oni with a shard of slater's stylus draws doors onto his tile his desired moves and progress of shapes with which to make and open his imagined line. Sorry about that. Uh, I muted myself. Um, Mark, would you like to join us for uh, a bit of Q and A? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank well, you. welcome, Mark. Um, so, uh, folks, once again, if you'd like to put uh, any thoughts or questions uh, into the chat, please. Um, and whilst you're doing that, I'll I'll busk a question. Um, I love that film. Thank you for doing that for me. It's really, Thank really you. generous of you um, to to put that together, especially for me. My first commission. <laughs> well, you, it wouldn't have happened had you not asked me to do it because I, you know, I was going to put a, just a, uh, the 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 sound enhanced poem, but it needed some images, and so you made me do it, and uh, and I found I could do that. That was just. I must say though, I, I I'm hoping it's it's just that the uh, internet on the boat is slow, but it was a very different experience because it was quite pixelated and jerky, which was quite interesting actually. Yeah, um, it, I don't it, it's an internet feature, and, and I think, to be honest, what I'll do is I will I will re-edit and use your original source video rather than the yeah. the, the, the transmission of um, of today when I when I put the recording together. So 
in all fairness, I'm just acknowledging that. But it is an interesting version, I must say. It's uh, it's yeah. more dreamy because it's, yeah, it's, it uh, yeah. decays at points. Uh, yeah. yeah, the slate starts to slide in a it way. Does. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but you do give that lovely um, feeling, both in words and in images, of the whole mountainside being just this, 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 this sea of broken, flat stuff. Um, and 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 you give us this sense of it being like fractured, and words are fractured, and images are fractured, and everything is fractured, and it's all about looking for the line. And the line is twofold because the line is you narrating, deciding how to piece these pieces together in words, but also by paralleling that with looking for roots in terms of climbing. That's another form of reading, and and you you that you you. you I'm not posing this as a question, am I? Um, no, you, you, it's it's great. It's, I love it. It's great. It, yeah. it, it, are you are you riffing on two parallel forms of reading? Am I riffing on two forms of parallel reading? I think there's probably more than two going on there. Okay. But that's not that's not to celebrate me. That's just to celebrate the world of material and uh, gravity and movement. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I've I've you know for a long time I've kind of started to realise that my climbing and poetry and my balancing, that they're, they're all one thing. Um, moving one's body through a landscape, through uh, a container, or on a surface, um, is so related to speaking and pushing air through a container across a surface, um, and the action of moving and touching one edge and another edge and my tongue touching my teeth. All these things are so interconnected. The little bones in my ears rattling, and I've talked about these things before. But it, yes, it's layers and layers upon of, of edges and surfaces and faces. Faces are you know very important. Faces that look at us, um, other than, as you mentioned before, um, you know, we, we, we tend to think that when we talk about faces on the rock faces, that being some kind of metaphor, but um, the philosopher, place philosopher and phenomenologist Edward Casey talks about an actual fact. It's probably that the faces are actually there and that we take our face from the landscape and its face. We learn our movements from it. We learn our expressions from it. We look at each other going, can we get up there? Can we go through that gap? And we do that look because that mountain made us look at each other in that way. So we are utterly, We've there's already been talk of, of entanglement, entwinement. And by the way, Victoria, what a beautiful uh, film poem that is. Beautiful reading as well. Gorgeous. Well, I, you know, I've seen a lot of film poems. One of the best I've seen. Gorgeous. Wonderful. So thank you for that. But yes, that entwinement, that entanglement of just being in the world connected. And quarries full of fragments and sliding stuff that you talked about have so much of that about them. Yeah. Well, we've got so much love breaking out tonight. It's uh, it's, it's <laughs> true. Um, let, let, let's go go with that. I've got one very short question before I then read a question that's in the chat. And my question is, given all I was saying and you were acknowledging about the sort of the slippy fragility of of these these slate landscapes, and the way in which that might translate into the way in which words coalesce in in in, in your poem of these landscapes, would different forms of rockscape generate different forms of poetry that's a very good question um that's a brilliant question actually luke you could write a poem about that actually that's really yeah i think inevitably so so johnny dawes is also one of the great gritstone masters and grit and slate are so different to each other gritstone is curvy and extremely frictionless whereas slate is smooth, fractured, and edgy. And the way Johnny moves, or the way I move, uh, on those two different rocks is very different. And, yeah, if I think about, because I've written a lot about gritstone, inevitably those words um, will come from the shapes and textures of, of the rock and the movement that we make. So, yeah, I mean, essentially we're, we're dealing in, in, in different materials and, and the words themselves are, are kind of extruded through and from those materials. So I think so, yes. But it'd be very interesting to start writing with that question in mind. It's a brilliant question, actually. I think it's probably a PhD in there somewhere. But... Yeah, well, it's just great. You're very clever, aren't you, Luke? <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs>
Okay. Uh, well, linking on to that, slipping and sliding on 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 the on the on the slate. I'm going to bring in Susie's question here. Um, she says there was an abiding sense of jeopardy in the film. Was it actually dangerous climbing over and up the slate, or were there more subtle dangers? Uh, hello, Susie. Um, yeah. Hi. Um, yeah. The, the, there was. I mean, I've been in the quarry a number of times. And there is always an abiding sense of danger. And as I got older and more aware of it, that came became very connected to the industrial danger there. Um, but in terms of the actual kind of physical movement, I mean, on that trip down, it, it, we didn't do anything particularly difficult. And, and all of us being quite experienced at moving in that environment and very careful um, and, and testing things, it wasn't an experience of great jeopardy. Uh, but always, you, yeah, you're in danger, and but that's part of kind of climbing and and caving and and being careful. Um, but for me, yeah, over over time, more of the danger has come from thinking about what it might be like to work in there rather than play in it. Um, you know, we we climbers choose to go down there and play, and to not have a choice to go into that place to work, that that's when it really starts getting truly frightening um yeah yeah great question thank you yeah hold that hold that thought collectively i'm inviting everyone to hold the thought about the link to workplaces i think that's something we could come back to in in the discussion at the end um just before we move on i'm going to go to uh, a fragment of matt's uh question in the chat so um the relevant bit is he says i'm wondering if you could expand a bit more on the particular sonic phenomenon that you described. Where is it exactly? Uh, and what kind of interplay experience do you have between human and slate amphitheater? Right. Human and slate amphitheater. That's that's a very nice line. You should write that down and uh, work on it. It's gorgeous. Um, yeah, that's brilliant. So I'll start with that amphitheater and, and think about it. And I'm now, now imagining the bottom of heaven's walls. So it's it's one of the deepest rifts, one of the deepest holes where that little hut used to be that is now covered over. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, I know a little bit about sound, um, but there are two levels that come into the bottom of there. And I was, I was down there doing a bit of recording and, and just walking around. And I just discovered a point where I could hear the hut um, in the usual way that when you're climbing, you can hear the hum. And then as I walked, the hum went increased in volume and changed tone. And I walked for about a metre, two metres, and then it went again. I went backwards and there it was again. So quite spooky. But I, I, I'm, I'm guessing it might be something to do with that acoustic amphitheatre being fed by two tunnels and something to do with odd kind of, you know, odd acoustics. But it, it it's spooky. And to be inside that kind of mouth more that is now speaking some technological industrial sound back to you um, is, is very human because the difficulties and dangers of technology are inevitably human. And then to be vulnerable flesh amongst the solid flesh of rock um, in that amphitheatre. There is a certain, yeah, it's less arena and, and more amphitheatre of, of performance, I would think, and relationship and conversation. So we can think of amphitheatre, I guess, as fighting place, but also performance place. And it is less arena. It, for some people, it is an arena, but for me, it, it's a negotiation. And, and if you don't make it a negotiation, you probably won't survive that long anyway. So, and as for humans, well, I described Johnny drawing his lines and his line. Those climbs are the, the motions of humans, the shapes of humans on a rock that was hewn out by other humans. So inevitably, the whole thing is layers and layers of, of human conversation. This poor late ape that's got to this point has made these big holes and, it, and is, has left all these kinds of traces, traces of pleasure, leisure, work, destruction, creation. Yeah, a fascinating amphitheatre. So yeah, go and write that poem, please, because it's a really good, a really good line. 
Lovely. Thanks, Mark. We're going to move on now. Um, but uh, thanks once again for, for putting that together Pleasure, thank specifically you. for this event. So a world premiere uh, in this session. <laughs> thank you. Uh, next, from so we're jumping from North Wales to Northern British Columbia. Uh, welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. OK, I'm going to try to share my screen here. Perfect. And then I just have to make sure I have it on my end. Yeah, we can see it. That's lovely. Thank you. OK, perfect. And let me minimize that. All right. So good evening, everyone. Uh, it's midday here in northern British Columbia. My name is Jennifer Wigglesworth, and I'm calling in from northern British Columbia in Canada. And this is on the unceded traditional territory of the Clayton Tanay. I am a white settler, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Okay, so to get right into it, in outdoor climbing, the first person who successfully ascends and sets up a route the is called the first ascensionist, gets to choose a name for it. And some first ascensionists use misogynistic, racist, homophobic, transphobic, or ableist names for routes. These names are not an isolated occurrence. Discriminatory route naming practices extend across North America, Australia, and the United Kingdom. This issue is also a very complex one. The first ascent tradition is made possible by settler colonialism, and it is one with a long history as well. So T.A. Loeffler wrote about sexist and homophobic route names that were published in climbing guidebooks across the United States more than 20 years ago. Route names are not well known outside of the climbing community. In contrast to ski hill runs, for example, signposts do not indicate climbing route names and many routes are in the backcountry. So questions about route names started to percolate in my mind after a climbing trip to Red Rocks, Nevada in February, 2017, in which I climbed a cliff called the Panty Wall that included numerous route names numerous routes named after women's undergarments. This prompted me to investigate if similar naming practices were used elsewhere. And I learned that the climbing community that I studied frequented a cliff with several misogynistic climbing route names. So I spend a lot of time thinking about whether or not to say these route names out loud. While it's important to name the sexism, the racism, homophobia, transphobia, and ableism in order to make real social change. My feminist political ethos also tells me, and I'm quoting Sarah Ahmed here, I am committed to challenging inequalities where I am by explaining what I oppose without elevating what I oppose to a position worthy of being debated. So therefore, I prefer not to insert myself in debates about whether or not these names should be changed. Instead, I highlight structures and the grassroots resistance that has created a platform to call these names out and to make climbing a more inclusive space. So on the next slide, you will read misogynistic names and an anti-Indigenous racist slur. You may choose to just listen along as I won't name them. So these are some of the routes or the names of the routes that I found in one climbing area in Ontario, Canada. Approximately 10% of the 182 routes at this crag exhibit discriminatory names. However, not all route names are overtly oppressive. Where some route names include blatant racial slurs or sexually violent language, others disguise their oppression behind colloquial language, puns, and inside jokes. Discriminatory route names were rarely challenged because of the widely accepted tradition of first ascent naming rights. However, in the summer of 2020, the advocacy around renaming routes gained momentum alongside transnational calls for racial justice. So in this presentation, I revisit data that I collected in 2018 that examined climbers' reactions to misogynistic route names and I document significant route name changes that took place in Canada and the United States since the summer of 2020. I argue that the politics of naming routes cannot be divorced from the settler colonial logic or a settler colonial logic that has long used renaming land as a strategy for nation building. Furthermore, I demonstrate that the successful renaming of discriminatory routes is one way to support different ways of exploring rock faces. 
So today's talk stems from one part of my PhD dissertation, and my doctoral project grew out of my observations of the very banal sexism I saw in the gym when I was learning to climb. I love to climb, um, and so turning a lens onto this can be difficult. But I am encouraged by Sarah Ahmed's work on complaint that theorizes killing joy as a world-making project. One of the biggest shifts over the course of my work has been my coming to a better understanding of the relationship of settler colonialism to leisure practices in everyday life. My disciplinary home fluctuates across sociology of sport, physical cultural studies, and leisure studies, and recreation studies. And in terms of theories of knowledge, I position myself within a post-structural epistemology, so I'm interested in knowledge and power and questioning whose knowledge has power. I use an analysis informed by feminism, uh, anti-racism and settler colonialism. And for me, a key aspect of feminist thought is that privileges and oppressions related to gender do not work independently of other systems of oppression. And I use qualitative methods. So the data that I discussed today includes semi-structured and focus group interview findings, but I also infuse historical and cultural moments into my analysis to contextualize my findings. In terms of key concepts, for me, gender isn't natural or biologically given, rather gender identities in the plural sense are culturally constructed by knowledge, values, and ideas that are acquired, embodied, and performed in relationship to powerful gender orders. Following Kate Maine, I define sexism as an ideological system of domination and misogyny as the police force of sexism. For example, if a woman tries to take power, she could be shamed, punished, and pushed back in place. Anti-racism means fighting against racism. It's a person's conscious decision to make equitable and consistent choices every day. Settler colonialism is about land, resource extraction, and wealth generation. In Canada and the US, European settlers use the processes of displacement, spatial confinement, and restricted movement to dispossess Indigenous peoples of their land and destroy their culture and group cohesion. It is an ongoing system of oppression and not just an event that happened in history. And settler colonial frameworks help me consider the politics of the land upon which outdoor leisure takes place. So I wanted to know how women climbers negotiated discriminatory route names. So I specifically asked about this when I conducted 17 semi-structured interviews and four focus group interviews. I analyzed the transcripts using thematic analysis. So I coded and then analyzed the data using com constant comparison. So I would read, reread and code the transcripts to decipher reoccurring themes and patterns. I spoke with 34 self-identifying women and they were aged 19 to 34. The majority identified as white. All 34 participants had completed or were in the process of completing undergraduate degrees. Given the woman's education and employment, it could be argued that the woman belonged to the professional middle class. However, while education is a good proxy for class, it is not foolproof as writing by working class academics and other professionals shows. The participants represented a wide range of climbing abilities, training on beginner to expert routes. So the following six themes emerged from my analysis and I kind of just have an exemplar quote beside each one. And um, for the first theme, this was frustration. Most of the women were frustrated by the overt objectification and sexualization of female bodies. Several mentioned that they would be embarrassed to share the names of the routes that they had climbed. The second theme that emerged was helplessness. Many of the women expressed disappointment with the misogynistic route names, yet felt that nothing could be done to change them. Several participants agreed that if women were to try to speak up against these route naming practices, their climbing merit and reputation would be criticized. A third theme was exclusion. A few participants described the misogynistic route names as a way of systemically excluding women. They advocated for renaming routes, rewriting online climbing guides, and abstaining from climbing. A fourth theme was internalized sexism. So alternatively, some participants found the route names humorous, and they rationalized that these naming practices were just jokesters trying to be funny. A fifth theme, kind of in response to the fourth, is pushback. 
So upon hearing that a few women felt the listed route names should remain unchanged or were funny, several participants pushed back against this acceptance. And then sixth was intersections. A couple of the women connected the misogyny of these naming practices with the settler colonial relations in Canada. So this would likely be the quotable quote of my dissertation as it sums up my project's intersectional focus on gender, empire, and the land. So Lilla states, as a climber and a woman, I would never feel that entitlement to like slap a name on it. What? They're conquering a mountain like they'd conquer a woman? Whose consent do you have to name this in this way? And does conquering require consent? So it's important to look for moments of resistance. And in, some, in the summer of 2020, I found much evidence of this in the climbing community. Several grassroots organizations and initiatives called for changes to discriminatory route names, including but not limited to Climbers of Color, Brown Girls Climb, Climb the Gap, Melanin Base Camp, Belay All, an adaptive climbing group. I attended several online webinars where I listened, observed, learned, and felt reinvigorated alongside fellow climbers advocating for change across North America. Climb the Gap, a collective that supports climbers of color, developed an open source spreadsheet for compiling discriminatory names. That document, which is mostly US based, includes 300 names. Climb the Gap is reviewing the names and reaching out to authors and publishers of the guidebooks in an effort to change them. They also listed the names of companies who advertise in the guidebooks and retailers who sell these guidebooks to put more pressure on the authors and publishers. Also, as of, 20, as of July 2020, Mountain Project, the most well-known climbing app in the industry in North America, included a crowdsourced feature for flagging discriminatory route names on their climbing website. The flagging feature led to route names being redacted on the online climbing guide. However, there were issues around how a racialized woman's labor for developing this feature was not credited or compensated. And on this slide, I want to highlight some of the successful route name changes that have occurred. And on the left here, this is from 10 Sleep, Rock Ranch, which is in Wyoming in the US. And then on the right, um, these route names that have been changed here are in Squamish, which is in British Columbia. And then in my own research, I am encouraged to report that in September 2020, a first ascensionist changed two of the route names at the crag that I was researching. So as I mentioned earlier, some routes disguise their oppression behind colloquial language, puns, and inside jokes. I had originally flagged this route that has been changed now to donkey see, donkey do, as misogynistic after looking up each of the route names in a slang dictionary online. I initially decided to withhold it from my analysis because I wasn't sure of its intended meaning. However, with it being changed, I can be more certain of its misogynistic origins. A takeaway here is that there is a need to include diverse people in the conversation to understand how names can be harmful. To accommodate all bodies and stories in outdoor spaces, we need to understand how the climbing community is excluding different kinds of people. However, with respect to the labor of changing route names, we should not lean on the free labor of Black, Indigenous, racialized persons and women climbers to call out oppressive names one by one as it is exhausting and they are often the recipients of the pain caused by these names. So what climbers and grassroots climbing organizations did well was, a, was directly address the problem of discriminatory route names. There was no skirting around the issue. I observed several climbers who did not withdraw from difficult and complex conversations. One thing that climbing activists and advocacy work has not yet dismantled is first ascent naming rights. This tradition continues to wield power. However, while the defense of first ascent naming rights still lingers, I would say that the defense of discriminatory route names, especially racist names, lost significant traction as of the summer of 2020. Some oppression subsided and made way for resistance, and with this name changes took place that helped transform outdoor climbing and support different ways of being at the cliff and in the mountains. P. 
People need to continue to push the agenda past the issue of route names and confront the settler colonial logic upon which climbing rests in Canada and the US. First ascents are predicated on the notion of quote unquote untouched cliffs. The idea that the land is a blank canvas is a harmful colonial narrative that conditions climbers and facilitates climbing's tradition of first ascent naming rights. Climbers presuppose that they are the first to climb cliffs, which erases indigenous people's histories with the land and indigenous people's names for cliffs and mountains. The time is now for the outdoor climbing community and others. So pictured here on the right of the slide is the bird watching or the birding community. So the time is now to reckon with discriminatory names. It is necessary to turn the gaze onto the larger institutional players, which have been long avoiding transparency and accountability. It is also time to ask larger questions. Who gets to name and why? Who maintains the database of names? Can this be outsourced to other folks? Upon whose land is the climbing taking place or the naming taking place? We need to reflect upon the act of renaming routes and features that erase Indigenous histories, languages, and names. We need to recognize the systemic ways that the climbing community pushes Black, Indigenous, racialized, trans, non-binary, disabled women out of outdoor spaces. The outdoor community has normalized the erasure of voices that have directly challenged white supremacy and the patriarchy, and it needs to consider the dis to how to dismantle the processes that can keep people out. So as I wrap, wrap up here, it is my hope that this talk contributes to a larger discussion about the intersection of gendered and colonial power and how they shape landscapes and how they shape recreation practices. Discriminatory route names can act as a springboard to reorganize outdoor climbing, support different ways of being at the crag, and create transformational recreational spaces. Even before the pandemic, numbers were trending upwards for participation in outdoor informal sports like rock climbing, mountain biking, which is the next session, snowboarding, and surfing. Participation in these forms of sport and recreation require access to nature-based spaces. With this comes questions of access, safety, responsibility, and sustainability. In this way, naming practices are deeply relevant to natural resource management. We need to think carefully about the land and the histories of the land. For example, the stories that we tell through heritage interpretation need to be inclusive, equitable, representative, and just. We need to reckon with our violent histories and ongoing legacies and address how these landscapes are filled with complex histories of conflict, displacement, and cultural loss. This research tale illustrates that it's possible to create social change in outdoor recreation. It is a tale that celebrates grassroots collective resistance. Changing route names will not end sexism or racism within the climbing community. However, it is one step. It is one problem that the climbing community is becoming self-aware of, acknowledging and rectifying. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, that's that's great. Um, I'm really glad that we were able to have you contribute to our session today, um, having come across your paper um, and having thought, why has no one written this before? It, it, it seems so obvious and yet no one has done it and you, you, you've, you've, you've done it so, uh, uh, so sort of tightly and succinctly. It, it's really, really, really great to have um, uh, to have your work here. Um, uh, whilst again, I'm waiting just for people to put any questions in the chat, I wanted to ask you, um, you, you sort of allude to it, but don't really go into the detail. Um, when first ascensionists are approached um, by, I don't know whether the word is activists, but you know, activist complainants, people who think this is not on, whatever, um, and all pressure is put on publishers of guidebook of climb books, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, what is the reaction? I mean, how, how how many first ascensionists sort of kick back and say, "No, I want it to be called insert here offensive title," or how many of them go, "Oh, I didn't realise it would upset somebody. I I just thought it was the kind of name that you were supposed to give things. Sorry, I'll change it." Uh, well, how, how much resistance is there to change? Right, that's a great question. Thank you, Luke. Um, so. I have watched this, which is really interesting, um, like kind of before the summer of 2020, when I noticed that shift um, kind of before that time. And I've looked at this on social media and there has been resistance to changing the names, um, but there has also been on the flip 
kind of push back to any of that resistance. Um, but I can say, for example, at the Craig that I was studying, when I first put out a blog that was writing about the names, it was in 2019, and I had an email sent to me that said, you know, someone's defending this name because it was um, named by a woman. And that was really interesting moment for me in the analysis to think about, okay, the internalized sexism, which I saw in one is one of those themes and what's going on here and how that, you know, this isn't necessarily men or um, men that are naming these spaces and what this might mean kind of more holistically or at large. So there was pushback and there was also pushback against the anti-Indigenous slur. Like, this is just what it was. This is what happened. You know, uh, a tampon applicator fell out of my bag, and that's why I named it that. And so there was resistance to names. Um, but then it was really interesting to see in, I'd say, fall 2020, those two route names that changed at the Craig. And they hadn't, and they would have seen or heard, I think, in their Facebook groups or social media groups about the piece had gone out. So I think there was a bit of a shift, but yes, there's been to kind of more succinctly say there has been resistance, but then there have been first ascensionists who have changed um, the names and then encouraged others to do so as well. There's folks who have been part of kind of this, um, I don't know if movement, but like shift in changing names who admit, you know, I named that and I feel differently now and kind of come out and talk about that. So it's kind of a, across the spectrum. Great, right, thank you. Um, Michelle would like to ask a question. She's going to ask it out loud. So Michelle. Great, thank you. Sorry, I've had some problems with my keyboard. So um, thanks Jennifer for your research. It's really fascinating. And I'm really, I'm, I know nothing, I know very little about climbing. So I have to say I'm quite shocked uh, but then, of course, not surprised, sadly. Um, so it's really um, brilliant to hear your research. Thank you for that. And it also makes me think about current debates that are happening here around the naming of species, sort of in ecology. And you mentioned birds at the end. I saw your last slide. So there sort of seems to be um, important conversations going across disciplines around this whole thing of naming and who gets to name and 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 the recent one was a couple of years ago I remember about um, uh, Beyonce eye for a bumblebee which just seems really uh, wrong but um, and sorry if this is slightly not within the remit of your research but I'm slightly interested to know that in in you looking at this naming, whether there's sort of been trends historically at certain points of time, and whether that sort of shows some some shift in uh, yeah in 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 what's being named how at, dif at different historical points, and I just wondered if certain names that you're and other people are sort of obviously critiquing now, whether that's um, I mean, obviously, this will go far back, but I'm just interested if you saw if you've seen any trends within that. Thanks. Yes, that's a great question. And my supervisor for my PhD um, is a historian, so she would be really <laughs> she would really like this question. Um, I would say that I haven't looked back in time too far to follow trends um, kind of before when I was starting the work. But I can think of one example, and it is with species and naming of species. And so um, in there's a what's called the gray jay. So it's a bird. It's a gray looking kind of jay. And it's flip flopped its name um, as the gray jay or the Canada jay multiple times, um, I'd say, in the last kind of 40 years. And so it's a really interesting example um of like colonialism with naming as well and nationalism and thinking about the nation state and there's also a lot of indigenous names for this same J, and it's known to be like a trickster J. it steals whiskey at campfires so it's also referred to as the whiskey jack J. and so that name was the gray J flipped to canada J, and then back to the gray J, and now again is the canada J. so and I know that in that example, there was kind of a focus on like the birding association getting together and saying, this is what we want to name. And this is why we want to put this forward. So 
that's the the most that I have to be able to speak to kind of that historical lineage, but I think it's really important. Um, and I think that's a great question for me to think about more. So thank you for that. Great, lovely. Thanks very much. I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of ask a question of the audience if that's okay. I'm I'm gonna sort of invite anyone from the sort of climbing fraternity to not not defend naming practices, but just uh, whether they've got any thoughts on whether culture is changing here in the UK in terms of approach to naming or whether North America is ahead. I mean, maybe I should turn it to a question for you, Jen, while people think about whether they want to chip in on this. But um, do you, in your work, notice any difference between the North American trajectory of of this kind of issue and what might be happening in other parts of the world or not happening in other parts of the world? Oh, I would be so interested to hear if anyone wanted to um, share what has been going on in, in the UK. And I, I first shared this research in 2018 at an international conference in Australia. And I was just talking about kind of the North American context. And I had several colleagues come up to me and share examples from the UK and Australia. And that's when, when I looked and um, found more. But I know I've seen names change in Australia. And it looks like Matt P wrote that it's definitely changing in the UK as well. Um, so I haven't kept so up to date on that, given that most of the organizations and webinars I was at were more North American based. But oh, thank you for putting that link in there, too. Um, an interesting part of this is because a lot of these conversations were happening during the pandemic, everything was on, more things were online. So I was able to kind of zoom into different webinars that I probably wouldn't have been able to um, if the pandemic wasn't occurring. Um, it probably would have been in person and sometimes especially too with like the delicate nature of the conversations. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, I don't see any more questions in the chat. So I think we'll We'll move along, but thanks once again for uh, um, for, for, for that really sort of thought-provoking um, and, and serious, in the right sense, sort of moment of thought. Um, not to suggest that Sarah and Gina can be anything other than serious, but you can be as serious or not serious as you like. Sarah and Jean. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen so we can start our images and then I'm going to hand over to Sarah who's going to begin our conversation with the with the quarry. Yep, it's looking good. Thanks Jean. So uh, Jean and I are colleagues in the School of Creative Arts at the University of Gloucestershire. Uh, the quarry that we'd like to discuss this evening uh, is rather more sludgy than the others that we've seen. Um, it's a deposit of blue lias clay uh, in an agricultural area close to the village of Bishop's Cleeve, which is outside Cheltenham in the west of England. Um, we first encountered the clay quarry site in 2019 when Jean was desktop traveling across Google Maps in preparation for Speculative Art School, which is a series of public talks, field trips and workshops that we organized at the university in 2018 and 19. And as far as I can recall, it was Jean's insistence that there must be a geological feature worthy of investigation uh, in our local area that drove the search. And it was the visual anomaly of the exposure of clay and the color of that clay, which seemed so incongruous with the familiar um, surrounding Cotswold limestone that drew her attention. Um, we've since um, physically visited the site a number of times, both for our own research and on field trips with students and colleagues and members of the public. 
Um, and this is the first occasion that we've had to put our thoughts and ideas about the quarry into any meaningful form. So we're very grateful to Luke for this invitation and thank you for listening. Um, and thanks to, to Luke for introducing the term quarry lurking to us, um, which we fully embrace. Um, and before I go any further, I'd also, I'd like to apologize to any geologists who might be joining us or anyone familiar with those terms because we are going to be using familiar terms and concepts um, that for the benefit of the rest of us help to contextualize our engagement with the quarry. So, um, so please forgive or, or point out any inaccuracies. So just um, pulling back for a moment from our current sense of, of national and geographic boundaries and delineations and thinking about where we are in time and space. Here in um, Gloucestershire, um, as everywhere, we're on shifting ground. The climate and landscape of this patch of land have, them, uh, have themselves undergone a fair bit of travel across the map. Gloucestershire has not always been here. It was once equatorial and along with the rest of Britain, formed part of a supercontinent called Pangaea. The movement of plate tectonics has trans transported this part of the Earth's crust from south of the equator northwards to its present latitude over the last 150 to 200 million years until we've reached our present position. Gloucestershire has experienced fluctuations in sea level and climate changes between ice house and greenhouse and changes in ancient deposition environments and associated rock types combined with past and current physical processes have produced some of the most varied geology seen within Britain and give rise to features such as the escarpments of the Cotswolds and the Forest of Dean, the outliers of May Hill and Robinswood Hill, the deep gorge of the Wye Valley and the low-lying Severn Vale. The oldest hills in the area are at the southern end of the Precambrian Malvern com complex, which are 700 million years old and are themselves the remaining roots of an enormous mountain chain. So emerging from the Precambrian into the Paleozoic era, 538 million years ago, and tra traveling through the Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous and Permian periods, we arrive at the Mesozoic era, which is 250 million years ago. At the end of the Triassic period and into the lower Jurassic period, a warm, deep, muddy sea covered equatorial Britain with a warm, wet climate giving rise to lush vegetation and abundant life. Blue lias clay, along with the silts and sands of the lias group, was laid down at this, laid down at this time 200 million years ago and forms the lowlands of the Severn Vale at the foot of the Cotswold limestone escarpment, which formed later, around 170 million years ago. It was interesting to see in Victoria's uh, presentation that seam of limestone in her first quarry image, which is most likely the same seam um, which runs from the southwest of Britain to the northeast of Britain. Blue lias clay that we can see here is essentially seafloor mud derived from the silted up sediment of the high mountains of the Mendips and Wales, which again are the remains of more extensive, more enormous mountains. The blue lias clay deposit in the Severn Vale is estimated to be 180 meters thick in the Cheltenham Gloucester area and then reaching 300 meters deep in the Evesham area. And our quarry site is between Cheltenham and Evesham. Um, but the license holders 
who work the site, uh, which are waste management company Grundon, don't know yet how deep the quarry is. They've not they've not reached the bottom. So the clay, uh, what is it like? Um, at the surface, the clay is slick and unctuous. It is by turns an iridescent bright blue gray, and then at other times completely absent of color, all mineral, deep and cold. What is it quarried for? So on their website, Grundon sells their low, low cost, clean and inert clay as engineering puddle clay. It is uh, a suitable liner for lakes, golf courses, fish farms, water channels, flood defenses, dams, and to secure, securely seal contaminated ground and for landfill engineering. It has low hydraulic conductivity, meaning that it provides a watertight impermeable barrier. So it's quarried by the license holder. Um, they, uh, they extract this naturally occur occurring clay, digging it out of the ground, at which point it becomes a resource transformed from a 200 year old, sorry, 200 million year old seabed into an economically useful commodity. So there, it's it's dug out of the ground and sold on. It requires no modification and can be sold as is with no processing costs. It's basically free. Then the vast hole or void that's been created is filled with waste, matter classified as business and or hazardous waste. Um, this then creates space, which itself is transformed into a lucrative economic unit. It's called in to service the eternal problem that our modern lives and cycles of consumption and waste produce, where and how to get rid of all the rubbish. In terms of monetary costs, then um, inert waste, i.e. business waste, is charged at three pounds, 10 pence a tonne. Um, and then landfill tax is paid by the landfill site operator. However, they pass that cost on to businesses and local council, councils on top of the normal landfill fees. So once the hole is filled with waste, it is capped with the blue lias clay to make an entirely sealed impermeable unit. The decaying material is then tapped for methane, which is converted in gas tanks on site and sold back to the national grid for electricity, um, which has the benefit of restricting methane, methane, sorry, from entering the atmosphere. But the most remarkable quality about this entire operation is how it forms the perfect capital accumulating machine, creating a cycle of extraction and profit at every stage with minimal cost or risk. So returning to um, to Jean's original discovery on the map of this site prompts us to ask, how does, how does mapping, surveying and image making enable extractive understand, understandings of landscape? William Smith's iconic geological map, we've, we saw a couple of slides earlier on um, from that map, uh, was first published in the UK in 1815, the map was called uh, a delineation of the strata of England and Wales with part of Scotland. 
and it visualized for the first time not only the surface dist distribution of rocks, but also how they relate in time and space. But it also calls into question what else the map activates. Um, William Smith was a, a civil engineer, a canal surveyor, a self-taught geologist. And so we can appreciate that his interest um, was from a scientific standpoint. But from the other side of the Industrial Revolution, we can also see how producing the map drove geoeconomics and became a resource for industry, facilitating and promoting the exploitation of natural materials without regard for the consequences. Um, and there's an, unde an undeniable link to colonial expansion and geo-exploitation across the globe. Um, and it's these mobile qualities that uh, Jean will now go on to discuss. So thank you. Um, I mean, Sarah has very ably introduced us to the, the site of the quarry and to its material history and nature um, and the conditions that produce these. So it's a site that witnesses ongoing cycles of deposition and extraction, cycles that are material, economic, anthropogenic, and more than human. Um, quarries have always set rocky and sedimented matter um, into motion. It's a matter that is mined and drilled, shoveled, removed and taken elsewhere. So in our encounters with the site, we have been interested in the contrasts and extremes that the quarry gives us access to, provoking us to consider what drives the mobilizations of matter, capital and affect that the site embodies. So one of the most immediate and striking contrasts is that between the slowest um, incremental sedimentation and compression of matter that produced the clay over many millennia. Um, so to sediment is to, to settle, to sit down. Um, for the clay to form, silty particles and once living matter needed to sink and to be stilled. Um, in a human lifetime, approximately two millimetres of, of sediment accumulates which would be a rate imperceptible to unaided human vision. In contrast, the extraction of the clay and the excavation of the pits is measured in months, a year or so, to re-sediment the excavated space with our rubbish as landfill may take a further year, layer compressed upon layer before the space is sealed over with more clay now an intercalation of vastly differing timescales and velocities. So this site exemplifies the accelerations and agencies of anthropogenic geology. So geology enables us to apprehend landscape along vertical axis from the satellite view, the map view, the stratigraphic view, to look down onto the earth, to look down through the earth, to bring up to the surface, to bury beneath it. The quarry's vertical geologies are self-evident. But along another axis, there are the horizontal geographies of mobilised matter. It is striking that one of the main uses of the extracted blue lias clay is infrastructural. As a watertight and stable material, it was used in the construction of the canal system from the 1780s onwards. So a network that enabled the accelerated mobility of industrial products to markets and of the materials needed to service these industries. At its height, a 4,000 mile network across Britain, in turn via ports to a network that was global. The clay was and still is used in railway construction, um, in road building, so the blue lias is a substrate to these systems of mobilization, transportation, logistics, profit, and economic efficiency. We can also consider the movement of the products and materials themselves, the result of multiple forms of extraction and distribution that form the landfill strata. 
So these are objects and matter that have their own histories of movement and migration. They may have already traveled across the globe from factory to container ship, to store, to household, office and business. The vertical axes of geologies and horizontal mobilities meet here. They're now sedimented into the Jurassic strata of the outputs of globalized economies, materials that themselves have ancient fossil origins, the plastics that were once Mesozoic life, or rare earth metals as old as the earth itself. So taking Jane Hutton's concept of reciprocal landscapes that links the economic, social, and eco ecological relations between constructed landscapes and the extraction sites that resource them, we might adapt this to consider the reciprocities between the infrastructural networks of distribution built on the clay extracted from here and the sites of production and circulation of goods from elsewhere. This relation, this reciprocity is also temporal between then and now and the times to come. The landfill materials are there in the excavated space where the clay once was because they're no longer needed, used, usable or desirable. Waste is a term that describes not the material itself, but our attitude to it, our regard for it or valuation of it. To waste is to, to ruin, um, to abandon. Waste is empty, desolate. We might ask what has been emptied out from this matter to render it as waste. Which is also to ask what brought it to this point where its sedimentation begins a new slow phase of decomposition as anthropog anthropogenic strata. So through what small window did this matter pass as a product, as an object of need or desire? So what propelled it here? So it's not only trade routes, logistical infrastructures and globalized patterns of labor, manufacture and distribution that move matter. There are effective mobilities at play. The dissatisfaction with the old, the desire for the new, the promise of a product that will change you, save you time, bring you closer to the life, the self or the business success to which you aspire. The acquisition is also a form of extraction one that changes the meaning of the material acquired. And until in turn that matter has been consumed to the point of its effective and affective exhaustion. So the geologist reads the rocks, the stratigraphy, the points of unconformity, transformations through erosion, tectonic raising and sinking, metamorphic encounters in the depths of the earth. A challenge presented by anthropogenic terrains is the difficulty in apprehending the layers that these sites encompass. Mapping, measuring and surveying technologies, techniques of representation associated with the governance of territory seem inadequate to the task. Instead, the quarry in its materiality seems allegorical as much as actual, physical and geological. It could carry stories a dynamic material expressiveness that calls for interpretation. Material narratives tell stories of that matter's emergence, its forms of being and of meaning making. Waste is storied matter. It tells of what it once was, what it once represented, what emotions, aspirations it once elicited or signified. And of course, how those meanings changed and fell into ruin how it became waste, abject, and literally thrown away from us. The story of how it came to be here, buried in the deep clay pit, our presence to be disappeared from our view. The pit is emptied and then filled with matter once meaningful and now emptied. But we believe that the supply chain exchanges of the quarry, the puddle clay and our own compacted rubbish remain eloquent in their expression of geohistories rather than geology. The matter is lively, it is well-traveled, it learns new languages of decay and transformation, and it sits down to share stories with the Jurassic fossils. So Sarah and I continue to be intrigued by the quarry and the questions it provokes us to ask about how earth strata are unearthed and become social, what this enables and to what ends. 
and how we become strata makers of human and more than human lias. What obligation this demands and how we should respond. And I will finish there and I will apologize that the slides move too quickly. <laughs> no problem, no problem at all. Um, thank you very much, uh, both of you. Um, when, whenever I'm composing one of these events, I obviously have to make decisions about who I'm going to put on in what order. And I'm really glad that I put you on last because that visual, visual shift, swerve almost, from sort of semi-romantic, crumbly rock sort of images that we've had in the, in the first three um, presentations to the sort of null aesthetics of your first few images where we're looking at a sort of dark grey pit of nothing at all joyful uh there's no reference that can make it seem artistic or 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 or, or worth uh, rhapsodizing about was was a really nice swerve um you also brought us up to date in the sense you brought us to a pro a current production um landscape which i think is important and probably will lead into uh, the, the main point that I've already sort of parked for discussion at the end amongst everybody. Um, so, so I won't quite go there with my question, but um, I just wonder what what did um, the operators make of your interest and did they at all sense a sort of critique? Because clearly you have a critique, um, but were they just sort of chuffed that anybody gave a damn about what they were doing and wanted to sort of have a look at it? Were they flattered? Dean. Sorry, they were what? I was just, I was just uh, saying, I'm uh, just offering the question to Jean if she would oh, like to right, respond. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think initially they were perhaps a little wary about mm -hmm. why we wanted to visit, um, but when we when we did visit, we found that the geologists there. Um, was extremely enthusiastic about our interest in the site, uh, was able to illuminate all sorts of aspects of the, the site's history, um, uh, really kind of bring us into that space. And we were very interested in the clay as this sort of malleable material. Um, and uh, they, they were interested in us taking some of the materials away and working with it. We uh, even connected with a local ceramicist who tested out the clay as a, you know, as a ceramic material, which is not how the clay is, is normally used. Um, we then went on to uh, do some workshops back at, um, back at studios where we were kind of working with the clay as this sort of mobile, very sort of unctuous material. It's very, it's very lovely to get your hands in. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> it has a, a sort of aesthetic to it actually. Um, so yeah, I mean, we 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 understand that they they could be wary that uh, you know the issue of landfill is potentially quite contentious. Um, that sort of scarring or extraction from the landscape, but um, I I think that we were able to find some common ground. Yeah, they them. were they were very generous with their with their time and their knowledge. Um, Charlotte, the geologist, had a fantastic collection of fossils in her office and in our slideshow um, you could see the Nautilus uh, fossil that was found uh, found on the site. Um, so it was very, yeah, I, I mean, in a sense, it sort of shifted our critique from that individual site really it's a we're discussing waste in a, in its kind of wider form and uh you know this site is simply dealing with a problem that that we all that we all have so um so it, it, yeah it wasn't directed at them as such and what what's the sort of follow on in terms of if there's an arc to your project, it seems to be pointing out towards the sort of the global implications of extractivism. Um, how will you 
how will you progress your project is it is it in terms of some form of artworks or is it in terms of more to do to do with a critique or uh, it, what's the what's the form in which you will develop those ideas do you think well, possibly remains to be seen i mean this is this has sort of nudged us to in a way to revisit the site uh through our records of it um mm -hmm. from previous visits um so you know we we're interested in working with it filmically i mean we've got we've got some interesting sort of temporalities um you know that concept of the sedimentation and the different sort of velocities of the you know the clay as a as as how it was produced and then um you know the 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 speed of its extraction and and circulation and and the the sort of accelerations that that implies so i think we would be interested in finding you know visual languages and conceptual languages that would enable us to deal with the with the contrasts um that we see the site encompassing yeah so we're we're um We've been talking about a film project for a number of years, um, and we would like to we would like to go to go back and film this site. Um, but yeah, again, kind of using using the site itself as a as a means of investigating many kind of different um, lines of inquiry that could be could be taken through it um and and less uh, sort of um the i don't know the uh it, its own um it's the the site uh, i don't know what i'm quite trying to say but um yeah but going back to that idea of critique less less the that site itself and more at the wider implications of it. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Okay, thanks. I'm trying to think, as we're having this conversation, I'm trying to think of the name of the person whose first name I think is Edward, who's a photographer of massive, great big holes in the ground uh, extraction sites. And I can't think of his surname, but it's sort of Polish. Batinsky. That's it, yeah. Um, is there a Gloucester version of those kind of projects or, 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 or are you not trying to sort of... Uh, Following that epic, epicness, you're 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 ploughing a a different furrow. I would say that because um, uh, as part of a, a an event that we ran previously, this original uh, interaction with the site, we then held a you know we we had a sort of mixture of workshops and discussions and curatorial um, elements to the to the project that we did. Uh, and one of them was to to screen uh, one of his films, which was about largely about China and extraction in 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 China. And and you know there is there is that sense of you know the sublime um, that's captured in the sort of you know the sheer scale and the sheer sort of grandeur and in a way the sh the, the the sheer sort of awe that um, uh, that that those kinds of sites or those kinds of processes can inspire. So I think we, I think we would not want to follow that route. I think we are interested in, um, you know, actually ad addressing that site and addressing almost getting quite close, quite close to that site and being able to work with um, it, it, the the contrasts in scale between the very specific and the very specifically situated um, and that sense of the mobilities and the distributions that the that the site is 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 sort of the, the cross that site and I think it's those contrasts that we'd be interested in bringing out um, but I, I think we are not interested in um, working with those kind of concepts of sort of visual yeah awe and grandeur because I feel that plays into the those histories of the representation of landscape that you know we find problematic and that we are considering as part of our critique. I um I'll just check in the I'll just check in the chat. There's nothing nothing in there. So what I'm going to do is morph um the, the QA 
specifically for you into a sort of close up open open house sort of Q and A, and I think I can do so by um, taking that point about awe and sublime, and then just moving it a few notches along where it becomes fetishi fetishism of industrial pasts and to a lesser extent industrial presence because we tend not to have fetishism of industrial presence so much um it's only when the thing has gone and we're at a safe distance a la the classic definition of the sublime that we can stare at the thing that's scary because we know we're in a position of temporal safety um, we're no longer having to as mark says actually go into the um the, the hollow of the uh, slate mine as a job of work we're going there out of choice as a an act of leisure um and across not just this this sort of exploring number three but exploring number one which was ruins exploring number two which was underground um natural and unnatural cavities um there's always the criticism uh, latent there that what we're doing is is going off and turning into leisure uh, uh, predecessors um uh industrial trauma and we're doing so um from a position of safety um and i wonder whether anybody really wants to pick up on that as a thread that has to be carefully navigated within leisure based exploration whether it's urban exploration whether it's quarry lurking whether it's um um potholing in uh drains and catacombs mark you've got your hand up you're on mute no you're not yeah um yeah i mean it's a very tricky question in some ways for climbers but um climbers come out of the victorian gentleman and then they come through the working class. They come through the the plumbers, um, you know, the likes of Willens. So there's a real kind of working class element to climbing. And then it comes to now. And I'm a little bit concerned that the, the, the whole history of climbing can be forgotten if there's not the attention paid to where it's come from and how it's come to here so when you go into the Noric quarries i think a lot of climbers of my age and and before and i don't know how many younger climbers i'm sure there are climbers who are sensitive to it know that a lot of those miners some of them would have even would have they were climbers in that they were climbing around and out of those kind of workers came actual leisure climbers as well and I think when you go into the Norwich quarries, there are a lot of climbers that their act of leisure is play, but there's also an act of connection and memory, remembering. And I met a climber, I've written a poem about it actually, who, who's worked in those quarries as working roots, putting up roots and cleaning roots and even easy roots for, for, for youngsters, et cetera, whose granddad worked in that quarry under the duress of having to earn a living. And there's a, you know, and I wrote the poem and it, and it really did touch him as well. So I think as long as we go into these places to play, because we need to celebrate living, we need to remember the pain as well. Um, I think that can work. And yeah, climbing does have a strong history from, you know, aristocracy through working class. And now, you know, hopefully not into an age where young people forget that and forget the the actual climbing history which is connected to all the other history yeah thank you yeah no thank you uh anybody else like to make a contribution on that score the downside of celebrating these spaces uh, victoria uh yeah I, I i don't know if i can speak to it's that kind of industrial trauma specifically thinking about that quarry that I was referring to but I think a lot of a lot of the work I was I was kind of doing in that quarry was was sifting through the trauma evident on the landscape so thinking about the kind of landscape specifically and using that as a way to come to terms with uh gendered trauma I guess and, and using that as a 
as a as a and using that quarrying language as a way to kind of sift sift through that uh the, the psychological impacts of gendered trauma um in in the work um so it's it, yeah I, I think because the the quarry was so small and it was you know this kind of penny quarry I don't I'm not sure if it kind of answers your question it's not um it's not a kind of mass industrial site but there's um yeah a, a direct link to me to this this kind of breaking open of the surface and and removal of kind of that temporal material that I'm I'm really interested in Thank you. There's a question actually in the chat um, for you, Victoria, from Natasha. She's she's saying she missed the name of the quarry that you mentioned and its location. You were you were keen to emphasise its private nature. So um, you, you, even though you you may I think have mentioned the name of the quarry, it, it's probably not somewhere that Natasha is able to get to. Sorry, Natasha. Yeah, it's it's just known as Old Quarry <laughs> on the map. Um, yeah, it's in it's it's just outside of Rosley in in Derbyshire. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer's added in the chat the, um, the, 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 the observation that um, climbers, when they do their thing indoors, are often doing them in industrial um, repurposed buildings. Um, uh, and so there's a sort of cross connection um, in those in, in those terms. Um, I suppose that, that I, I don't know, maybe there has been a, an instance of this, but I suppose those buildings lost their industrial lives before they were appropriated by climbers. I can't think of a factory shutting because climbers were keen to get in there and turn it into a climbing um, a climbing space. I know that's not what you're saying, um, Jennifer, but um, let's not blame the climbers for deindustrialization. Um, I don't think we can go that far, and you're not, but I'm just running the thought through my head as to whether or not we can blame them. Um, uh, uh, Mark? I just want to also say that there are quite a few climbing walls in churches and of course churches have been dug out of the ground and reconstituted into those buildings and now the climbers are, yeah mm. so yeah i just wanted to mention that those are very interesting spaces um yeah every building is a relocated quarry i suppose yeah absolutely or a it's, relocated forest in the yeah. north american context perhaps <laughs> yeah and i kind of think of quarries as kind of inverse mountains yeah yeah. Right. Oh, uh, we've got something that. Oh, hand up from Michelle. Michelle, do you want to chip in? Um, I really take your question and the point that 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 lies in it and the responses. But I guess also what's important though now, and what all the presentations do is look at the sets of relationships. So it says, okay, well, when those those types of modes of production are no longer functioning here, although they are obviously in the ones that you were talking about in Gloucestershire. But actually you're looking at, okay, what, how do we relate to these spaces? And that's what's fascinating about all the, all the presentations actually. So it's not about simply discounting history, but it is about, okay, so when some sets of relationships don't directly have that as part of their experience, what's going on in those experiences now? And and what what's at play in these sets of relationships? Yeah, yeah, and I think actually Matt's uh, point in the chat sort of ties into that, which is that um, the ability or the inability to get into spaces in which climbing or other activity might be carried out are all determined by relationships of uh, resource ownership, the ability to enclose power to open up whatever whatever it might be so so there are all sorts of uh modern past and possibly future focused relations that are that are, that are wrapped up um into this um thank you uh, if anyone's got any final points now would be the moment to um to, to, to pipe up either on the chat or, or vocally but i think we may have um reached bedtime um, in which case, uh, I shall uh, thank you all very much for your uh, your, your contributions. Uh, certainly, given me a lot to think about, and uh, very much appreciate the effort that's gone in from all of our presenters and some great questions raised too. 
um, along the way. So thank you very much. Um, because I've got to do a bit of uh, uh, recomposing to make sure that we do justice to Mark's film. It will probably take me about a week before I uh, um, upload the um, recording, but uh, I'll send around a message when I've done that so that everyone knows it's available. Um, and uh, if you if you like biking, we've got another one in a few weeks' time on mountain biking. Um, thank you very much to one and all and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.